the next speaker um, to address this um, uh, component of the uh, pain management is Dr. Heather Tick. She's the first holder of the Donald Kandel Professorship of Integrated Pain Medicine at the University of Washington. Um, she has expertise in family medicine, pain medicine, and integrated holistic medicine. Um, she has done extensive research in uh, kinesiology and is the author of Holistic Pain Relief. Um, welcome, Dr. Tick. She will talk about integrated therapies and foundational pain treatment. Very privileged to be here, and I certainly enjoy having the opportunity to speak after uh, that last talk because I don't know the last. The moment I have to do this with my eyes closed would be a great shame. Um, that's my disclosure. Um, I'm going to uh, brush through some of the slides, especially the ones with uh, settings of data and references, and hopefully you can have. Uh, PDF of it uh, for the references to you want them. Um, uh, and I want to talk a little bit first about uh, some, just some general principles of integrative pain medicine, integrative medicine, uh, how it is different from conventional medicine, and then some specifics. So, um, as, as physicians, what are some of the habits of conventional physicians? We're well intentioned, uh, we're rushed. We're buried in electronic paperwork. I mean, good demonstration of what all that data does for us, but it's a burden to the clinician. We rely a lot on tests. We get focused on getting a diagnosis. 54% in primary care in the United States and North America are burnt out. And unfortunately, we are part of the system that is the third leading cause of death in North America. I'm not sure what the statistics are elsewhere in the world, but in, in the first world medicine, um, we have a lot of collateral damage. We put a lot of trust in certain things, validity of tests, and the applicability of the particular tests and what they, how, they, um, how they refer to, how they inform what our decisions should be about the particular patient that we're looking at right now not just the statistical probabilities, but how does that relate to our patient? And the latest trend. We don't really like to think of ourselves as, as following trends, but when we look at it, we do. Um, there were trends, for example, there were certain things we used to call heart murmurs that we would hear before there was echocardiography. Suddenly there was echocardiography, and we realized, oops, that's something else. But how certain were we? How dogmatic were we? that when we were listening to it in consultation, we said that we were right. And how dogmatic are we now about the conclusions that we have? And how will that change as the technology and the science advances? We also put a lot of trust in drug solutions and in more drug solutions once we have side effects. <laughs> we put less trust in the laying on of hands, but the science of laying on of hand of is very uh, well developed. It began with Skinner back in the 60s, with those totally inhumane uh, studies he did on the baby monkeys. Uh, now there's kangaroo care in newborn nurseries where it's recognized that skin to skin contact of uh, neonates um, in, uh, in ICU is actually more beneficial for, for many of them than keeping them in incubators. Uh, and there's a lot of good nursing literature on the, the benefits of touch. We don't believe, mine, I just picked a few random things here, micronutrient deficiencies. Uh, they aren't something that we pay much attention to in our day-to-day -day practice. The ability of the body to heal is also something else that we don't uh, recognize very well under chronic conditions. We recognize it certainly acutely, we pay attention, we study that. But what about healing of the chronic illness, the chronic conditions? <laughs> And then the interconnectedness of all systems. We study medicine in parts. We have specialization, which has brought us tremendous advances in terms of, of what we can do in modern medicine to keep people alive. Um, but then when we, when we need to put it all together, sometimes there are gaps in that. 
And there's a very interesting study, or not a study, an interesting paper in PMJ, I believe, uh, called Have We Just the Right Frog? It's about 10 years old. And it, it's basically outlining, it's by an intensivist who wrote the article, and basically he's saying most of the advances in, in intensive care, the recent ones, come from doing less, not from doing more. And let's trust in these folks who have spoken out against the very studies and data that is published in their journals. And this is an indictment of our profession and our integrity. And we, we should pay attention to what we're considering that data. Um, we have less experience with a focus on health as a positive attribute and how that can help both our patients and ourselves. <coughs> neuroplasticity um, plays a role. And neuroplasticity is something that's going on all the time. It doesn't just happen in, um, in particular conditions. You know, we know about neuroplasticity when we were training a, a tennis player to, to do his practice, his, his serve 150,000 times a week so that it will be automatic and it will be uh, in, imprinted on his brain. But when we're focusing on disease, so when we're constantly asking our patients about how much pain do you have, how much disease do you have, how ill do you feel, we're affecting our neuroplasticity as well as the patient's neuroplasticity. So do we want to focus on health or disease? So why do patients turn to complementary alternative strategies and integrative medicine? And they spend a lot of money every year, and that's actually what has got the attention of conventional care, is how much money people are willing to spend on this. Usage is increasing steadily with every study that's done. What are they looking for? Customer service? Maybe. We now know that primary care practitioners get to spend an average of seven minutes per patient and allow them to speak for 16 seconds before they feel compelled to ask the question and interrupt them because they have to get on with the appointment during this time. So patients seem to be saying they get better patient experience elsewhere, <coughs> that they find that they are getting value for what they're spending, and there are also many gaps in services. And do they trust us? They're reading the same stuff we are. The risk of standard of care. We all know about the opioid risk. We don't have to discuss that with this group. Uh, and in, in, for chronic pain, the escalating drug use procedures being done hundreds of times more than they used to be, and no improvement in outcomes. And then there's the whole issue of, of pharmaceuticals and of us being part of the third leading cause. Uh, if you haven't seen it, Don Berwick from the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, IHI, uh, he was the founder and the, uh, the uh, CEO of IHI for 25 years uh, developing uh, QI, quality improvement science. His address to the 27th annual meeting is actually a sea change for him and for IHI in terms of its focus. It is all about transformation. It's no longer just that QI, we can QI our way out of this, we can't. And he describes it very, very uh, poignantly. We don't need to change the tires on the car. We don't need to adjust the carburetor, our set of carburetors. What we need is an airplane. We need something different. So what is it that distinguishes integrative medicine and integrative pain medicine? It's not just that I want more things on the menu. It's the focus on health creation rather than on disease management. Who and what am I treating when I go into the room? Am I treating the tests? Am I treating the diagnosis? So just a word about diagnosis. Now, we all live with diagnosis. We have to live with diagnosis um, because we really have no choice. It's a concept. And like all conceptual thought, it eases our way through life. But when I call when I call something a tree, whether it's a palm tree, pine tree, or an oak tree, there's a vast difference between what I mean when I call it a tree. But there is something treeness about it. But there are individual characteristics that I'm ignoring, significant individual characteristics. And that is what we do every time we focus on a diagnosis. We have no choice. 
we, we have to do this. It helps in acute situations, emergent situations. We need it for billing and coding. We need it for patients' entitlements to, to care. But we need to remember that we're ignoring individual characteristics. The disadvantages of, of ignoring that uh, make us overestimate the, uh, the benefits that our treatments hold. Now, medicine and the pharmacological industry both came of age at around the same time. It's after the And uh, And at that time, we developed this silver bullet model of um, care and effectiveness. And the reason that happened was that, for example, we had pneumonia. Pneumonia used to kill 50% of its sufferers before antibiotics. So suddenly we had antibiotics and people down the hole were surviving pneumonia. And we thought that that was the model for everything we were developing and everything we were doing. And we used that model, that literature was too often. And yet it, it isn't that applicable to most of the chronic conditions that we work with. So medicine acts like a game of dots, connect the dots. And so we gather up all these dots, and then, uh, and then we tend to forget about some of the connectors of these dots. So this is my lame way of doing animation, and this is, these are some of the connectors, and only some. So what is the context that this patient lives in? What is the community? What is the family? Uh, what, about, what about the energy? What about the forces within the body that we're, we're learning about? It's now what's happening with quantum physics and how that reflects on, on the energetic relationships and not only our tissues but our cells to others within our community and within our sphere, our electromagnetic field that stands quite far from each of us. Um, what about fascia? Fascia was, um, fascia was a chunk when I went to school. Um, as the surgeons used to say, they used to just that is just what defines the medical surgical field. But it didn't, it was a structure, it didn't have a function. I think I see the problem most of the business as the patient. So, my conventional medical education. I'm wondering if you can have that comment and let me talk just for a few questions. Okay. Uh, how many minutes are there? Um, okay. okay. What I didn't learn to focus on was nutrition, exercise, sleep, stress management, work life balance, myofascial pain, or pain in general. Very little on that. How did we get this so wrong? Countries of modern practice have pushed us to accept simple solutions to complex problems. And as Malcolm Gladwell says, we have a storytelling problem. We're quick to come up with explanations before we really have an explanation. I'm not going to go over the problems with opioid therapies, NSAIDs, equally uh, evidence-based, but equally uh, causing significant morbidity and mortality. Um, and proton pump inhibitors are the next on the chopping block, and that there's a reference there in terms of all of the, uh, the disadvantages, the risks of taking long-term PPIs. And all of these have an impact on pain, so the nutritional deficiencies that you get with PPIs, uh, impact pain, B12, magnesium, protein. Are we looking for the answers in the right places? So uh, this is data from the EPIC study. 93% uh, of diabetes, 81% of heart attacks, 50% of strokes, and 36% of cancers can be prevented through these four healthy, um, uh, healthy activities, healthy lifestyles. And this was 23,000 people who were followed for 7.8 years. I'm going to just, I think I'll just talk on food and then um, uh, cover some of the other, other issues that, that I was going to. Um, we change our body chemistry every time we eat. And one of the most impactful things we can do with our patients is make sure that they are nutritionally sound. There are micronutrient deficiencies even in the country with the highest rate of obesity in the world, which is the USA. Now, unfortunately, the rest of the world is catching up with our eating practices. Obviously, 
Um, uh, everybody else wants McDonald's and uh, donuts and Coke for breakfast. But we are, we are damaging our health by doing that, and we're damaging our patient's ability to heal as well. Now, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, unfortunately, um, uh, are too effective. They damage the ability of the body to heal, as we know now. Um, you know, there's, there's tendon issues, there's uh, bone formation issues, and uh, it's because they have the first step of healing, which is also an inflammatory step. So is this the information we want, or is this it? Uh, Metchnikoff won the Nobel Prize for Social Immunity, but he also predicted the microbiome. He outlined that there were good and bad bacteria, and that they determined our health. He did that in 1908, and we forgot about that for about the last, for 80 years after that. <clears throat> the difference between these two mice is microbiome. These are genetically uh, cloned mice, and if you swap to their microbiomes, they would change body habits. Diet also changes epigenetics, and these epigenetic changes are heritable, which means that this mama orange uh, agouti mouse is obese, diabetic, and uh, she gave birth to a little brown mouse simply because she was given vitamins, B vitamins during her pregnancy. And those uh, offspring of the little brown mouse are going to be little brown mice because those changes in the mom were heritable. Uh, diet also changes tissue pH, which is found to be very important in pain. Uh, there's two references there on that. Uh, the micro, the uh, mitochondria function best with a pH of 6.5 to 7.5. And we are lowering our pH beyond that if we eat a diet that's high in Fine foods, grains, and animal products. Um, I'm just going to run through. These are all topics that are pain relevant, and I hope you can get a PDF of these. Uh, turmeric is a superfood. Turmeric is being studied for pretreatment uh, of surgical patients with uh, reduced analgesic use postoperatively and uh, reduced GI complications postoperatively, secondary to that. Uh, skip myofascial pain, mitochondria, um, energy production, detoxification. They are very susceptible to free radical damage. And the solution to mitochondrial dysfunction is a robust system of antioxidants. That's a nutritional solution. And there's one quote about mitochondria. This is a little mind quote. Oxfos defects reduce mitochondrial ATP production and can theoretically give rise to any symptom in any organ or tissue, at any age, with any mode of inheritance. Now let's try and keep that in mind for the better patient we see who has Thank you.